welcome back to another week of Art Life. In this week's episode, I'm going to be talking about my life as a professional full-time artist. I'm Jessie. I've been a full-time artist for 10 years and thought it about time I start sharing my painting techniques and adventures. Subscribe to join me every week for a window into my art life. So based on last week's episode, those of you who haven't seen it, please do check it out. It became apparent that in sharing some of my past, it might better share more about what I'm doing in the present, why I'm painting the things I am, um, also sharing a little bit with you about my education, the different things, different jobs I've had. Um, it all is still part of my practice um, and how I live as an artist. And it's the kind of thing you don't really talk about anymore. You, you're always living in the present as an artist, focusing on the current body of work, the next exhibition. You don't really reflect on um, everything that came before. So. I'd like to share that with you in this week's episode, starting with education. So education. Anyone who watches this channel will know that I have a passion for learning new skills and techniques and art history. It's not just about the techniques and mediums of the kind of oil paint that I use, but I love to know the kind of old classical techniques of a more atelier um, training that they don't maybe offer in schools nowadays. Um, I had to go to Italy, to Florence, to learn how to paint kind of classically. I was looking at these master paintings in museums. I was like, where do I learn how to do that? Um, because it was very hard in this kind of English curriculum of school painting. You can't grade art. How do you grade art in a classroom? It's impossible. And nowadays, there's not enough time in a classroom to learn the kind of intricate details of how to paint with oil. They just expect you to know this stuff, how to deal with light and shadow and observation, which is mostly what learning the basics of art is, is observing what you're drawing or painting. Um, again, I had to go to Carrara into the mountains in Italy to learn how to sculpt with marble. I had to enroll in a school in Florence to learn how to paint like the masters because I went to a museum, I think it was like the National Gallery or something as a student, and I was looking at these masterful paintings going, how do I paint like that? Why aren't I learning that in school? Um, so I kind of had to be a little bit creative with where I got my education. And actually in writing out all the kind of details of my education for this um, episode, I realised I have nearly seven years of education, which technically makes me a doctor before I've even embarked on my PhD. So when I think about my journey as a painter, it definitely arrives about 12, 13 years ago when I went to Florence. I was about 18, I enrolled in a school to learn Italian quickly. I found a school that would teach me um, the basics of how to draw and use materials with oil, like so I could begin this journey of learning how to paint figuratively. Um, when I look back on some of these kind of classical studies I did now, which are hanging up in my parents' house in big gilded frames. Um, it is remarkably different to what I do now. But again, a big part of my journey, because once I could learn the skills to paint anything, I could then decide and be choosy about what I actually wanted to paint, not be restricted by a lack of skill. I was able on weekends to explore Italy, explore history of art at the British Institute of Florence, where I could learn art history, more about the Renaissance of painters and art historians I was so interested in, this revival of naturalism and beauty, I definitely think sparked my interest in landscape and a return to this kind of study of um, light and mysticism in painting. Just learning, having the ability to go and find the skills I wanted to learn and learn them in a way which was beautiful living under the Italian Tuscan sun. So when I came back to England, I knew that there was a way of approaching um, university education with the arts. In the UK, you have to usually get a foundation degree. So I went from living in Tuscany to living back in Suffolk, where I enrolled at college, to do a foundation year, um, which I actually hated because I was one of the only painters, um, which is quite sad, particularly after you know missing the, the glamour of Italy. Um, I did get to spend some time in New York, which was nice. Um, I also had an amazing teacher who kind of, basically I just got to have one-on-one -on -one time um, learning about a bit more about how to think about embarking on a more business side of being a painter because 
a lot of stuff as an artist isn't just about painting which is what education is it's this lovely world this bubble where you can just create and not have to worry about anything just work to your deadlines um no when you're a professional artist you have to figure out how you uh create work how you copyright it if you do reproductions if reproductions can devalue your work finding a gallery relationship or representation as a painter um, how you apply for different residencies and bursaries and grants there's so many ways you can kind of approach your practice and I think going through this kind of education system in, in England when I came back from Italy was a really good way of learning the business side of it so I then moved to London <laughs> It was the only place I wanted to be because it was where all the interesting galleries were. For me, it felt like one of the main hubs of the kind of conceptual and creative art um, scene, uh, particularly in Europe um, at the time. Italy was quite quiet for that. It looked to the past. There wasn't too many exhibitions going on for current artists that were um, contemporary. So London was where it was all happening. Um, and I was there to study my bachelor's at City and Guilds of London Art School. Um, which was the perfect, literally, I cannot tell you how perfect this place is if you have come from a independent way of learning. It's eccentric. I remember the first time I went into the loos, there was these marble busts by the female toilets, just, you know, just chilling, just, you know, right by the sinks, just these Venus, this Venus in her toilet was just chilling in the bathroom. Um, again, they did life drawing. We had amazing studio space and small groups to study in. There was like 16 of us in our year rather than a hundred people. So we had like one-on-one -on -one tutorial time. And the main thing about City and Guilds was the network I made, the, the tutors, the uh, lecture series, the friends I made. These are still um, friends I have today who are still really close in my life. Um, Tony Carter was uh, the principal at the time, who pa he passed away a few years ago. And I'll never forget on our uh, graduation ceremony, he said that, he said that to be an artist, you are at sea in a boat and it can be very still waters or it can be very choppy. It's a journey, it's exciting. It's also quite stressful. When you come in to uh, study at a place like City and Guilds, it's like a port, it's like a harbour to rest, to regroup, but also to exchange ideas, to critique each other, to help learn in a way which feels like a safe space. And I, even though I've left City and Guilds, I still feel like it's important to create a really safe space for yourself as an artist, so that you feel like you can explore your ideas in a way that feels like you're not going to be under a lot of criticism, which social media, social media, which social media can be quite damaging for uh, in knocking confidence if you're alone and you're sharing stuff online and you're maybe not receiving lots of likes or lots of kind of attention or, or good feedback, it can knock your confidence. So you have to find a way to create, like I have with this studio, um, an environment in which you feel like you can make things, being authentic to yourself and that you can have um, protection against things which knock an artist's confidence. Um, and City and Guilds was also a really good experimentation for me in curating exhibitions. I started to um, really enjoy the process of putting on shows, raising sponsorships with um, different companies who wanted to get involved. Collaboration became a really big thing for me um, at university. Um, my artwork itself became quite focused on seascapes at the time. I did struggle with living in the city, so I liked going out into nature um, and just kind of reconnecting to things I loved with um, space and light. I think some of my work, I went really, really big. Um, it was mainly dealing with the subject of toxicity in nature. So I got interested in the subject of sirens and odyssey. And again, my class, my love of classicism came up, but painting the ocean like a beautiful but toxic siren, luring you into the water, but also being there like an edge of danger. This was all in the territory of the sublime. I was obsessed with the subject of sublimity, beauty with a, a hint of danger um, when I was at school. Um, and that did carry uh, through my practice um, as an artist. I was fortunate enough on graduating, I put I was put forward for an exhibition at Mal Galleries uh, called the Future British Artist Award in 2015. And I actually won, which is really nice. Um, yeah, FBA. Um, I was Future British Artist. I was signed by a gallery in Cambridge. Um, it was apparently all going to happen for me. Everything was just going to flow. The momentum was there. So what did I do? I decided to pack up my life and move to New Zealand. 
two years and live on a beach and surf and paint and just be really, really happy. I then came back and just had to start again. I came back and suddenly was out of sync. Two years can make you completely out of touch with the city. Um, so I decided to do my master's to return to my, um, to return to study uh, with my master's in Brighton. <laughs> So yeah, living by the sea was a must and I felt so full to the brim of inspiration because I had been traveling the world for two years, not just New Zealand, I'd explored so many beautiful landscapes um, and I felt full to the brim of inspiration. Um, I'd also explored the Holy Land. I'd been fortunate enough to um, go from Jerusalem to Galilee to Egypt. Um, I spent a lot of time um, just kind of thinking about light and the way light changes in different kind of parts of the hemisphere, nearer the equator, far away from it. Even just the observations of extreme landscape. I've got very into kind of adventure painting and extreme sports. Um, and that kind of featured heavily into um, the landscapes I was interested in. So Brighton was a bit of a change. It was very flat landscape, but there were some beautiful white cliffs. And um, this was about five years ago. And it coincided with uh, when I met Rafe, who as a filmmaker could document and record a lot of my um, practice as an artist in a way which I'd never been able to do before. Um, so there's a lot we could share in the Brighton years. Um, in this episode of kind of images of my work, which I'd never had before, uh, which I'm very grateful. Um, thanks, Rafe. So at this point, I'm about 26 and I've spent all of my money uh, traveling and I have a bursary from the government to study a uh, student loan, but it's not enough for me to kind of, you know, buy all the materials I need and live in Brighton and still travel um, whenever I can. I spent I, I spent a lot of time in Canada as well that year. So um, supplementing my income was important and not just from commissions, which they were still happening. I was able to sell to some private collectors who had invested in my work in the past. Um, and I had a few small commissions that dotted throughout the year. Um, but I was creating new work and I didn't really know how to market it yet because it I wasn't really sure what it was yet. Um, and that's when curating exhibitions for charity uh, in a company called From the Studio Floor really um, kind of saved me. So From the Studio Floor, um, it originally started from this idea that all of my artist friends and I were making work now in solo studios and we didn't have that sense of collective anymore. So in doing a salon show, one work per artist, no commission. We knew that galleries were taking 50% of the sales that we were making per painting or artwork. No commission. It would just be 20% to charity, the rest to the artist. We'd get sponsorship from some amazing companies who would be inspired by our work and the energy we'd bring to uh, these exhibitions. And there would just be pop-up shows for a week. We then brought in the element of charity and I found this amazing charity um, in Cambridge from near where I grew up called Campsite and they support the blind and visually impaired around Cambridgeshire um, and in collaborating with them suddenly it was a game changer because we had blind artists coming to us saying can we exhibit with you guys who you know they were working more um, with visual impairments with touch um, more sculptural work there was one artist she could only see um, like one colour so she made like the most beautiful um, painting but again the nuance of colour was just through her eyes which was extraordinary and it also helped build the confidence of some of the artists who um, were very visually impaired and you know in showing their work alongside a professional artist who was selling their work for £20,000 in a big London gallery or an amateur artist who's never shown before you know it was bringing together artists from all different backgrounds in an environment which felt supportive um, and that's what I love. I love bringing together art, education and charity in a way that feels nurturing and positive and fun, not stressful, which is what, something I always try to tried to avoid um, with curating exhibitions. I've actually got a video of one of the shows we did in Cambridge before lockdown. Check it out just so you can see the diversity of work that we have um, in these sorts of spaces for these shows.
watching these exhibitions gave me so much confidence about my own um, kind of love of painting and the kind of working with other artists. Um, I then got really into collaboration. Um, one of my amazing friends, Kaz Watson, who I met in Brighton, um, we were talking about um, collaboration and how bouncing off another artist gives you so many more ideas. Working together on projects makes things happen in a way which feels expansive. So we actually did just a really big drawing to kind of embody this energy um, where we covered an entire exhibition room in one piece of paper and we just filled the walls um, with this beautiful drawing. And I think Rafe actually got a video of that as well. So I just want to show you that just so you can see how collaboration is so inspiring for me in my practice even today. So from graduating with my MA, um, the work with charity actually put me into um, the next relationship which took me through the next part of my career, which was eventually to be uh, the art director of a London gallery um, in East London, which I was doing right up until lockdown. Um, so I, I'm still painting full time, but I'm always kind of doing other things to keep the momentum of my practice kind of um, engaged and this was with a gallery called Anderson Contemporary um, which was such a fun few years where we were literally building the gallery and a residency space from the ground up. The residency space had six studios which was all for charity again but this was a charity working with a school for autism um, and they were also supporting artists in Hackney Work East London uh, to find space and create space. In London particularly studio space is so expensive it's impossible for artists sometimes to be able to afford to live in London, yet alone fund a studio space. Um, so we offered residency spaces upstairs and downstairs was the gallery space. Um, we've actually just had a call to artists for the next year's um, uh, wave of uh, resident artists in residence. Um, so next time there's one coming up, maybe I will share that. And if there is any artists in the London area who are looking for free studio space, you know, you can get in touch via the website andersoncontemporary.co.uk and um, we do have an Instagram account, Alison Contemporary E3. Um, although I'm not the art director acting anymore because lockdown changed everything. Just before lockdown, we were about to open to the public. We had exhibitions planned, collaborating with art artists who work in, you know, all different forms and mediums and sculptures and paintings. We were going to work with different foundations. Um, we had amazing artists lined up who were were, um, you know, working at Goldsmiths, you had connections to Sotheby's and, you know, different universities. The, the whole potential of this space to bring education, charity and art together would have been absolute utopia. Alas, it was not to be, the pandemic happened. And so while I was kind of working with the um, collective at Anderson Contemporary Gallery, um, I was also doing some traveling as well. I was never really still, I didn't have a solid studio. I had a traveling studio it would be about where was the nearest ocean we could go to to surf and paint and be in nature and then i would work in the city and then be off again exploring the mediterranean i went back to new zealand this time with rafe and then the lockdown happened and everything shut down the gallery didn't open for two years um I got back into the studio, I was suddenly only thinking about painting. I was painting prolifically, big work again, uh, work in which I hadn't had, had, I hadn't had time for years just to focus on painting a body of work in which I could um, re-engage in the art market in a way which I hadn't done for a while. I'd basically just been selling a painting and using the proceeds to fund a flight to some far-flung destination and I'd lived like that. Um, out of a backpack for a few years. Now I wanted to have a stable space, which is this space. Um, 
And the lockdown afforded me that. It gave me the time and space to refocus on my practice. And of course, Art Life was born from the lockdown, wanting to chat and not go mad, being in quarantine, chat to you guys. So good things did come out of the coronavirus. Who would have thought? Um, but it kind of brings me to where I am now, which is obviously very much in my research and my painting, um, but also thinking about the patronage of what's come before. Um, patronage. Also thinking about how I sell my work. So if I, I am thinking if I want to start a relationship with a gallery again, um, which can be very supportive when you have representation. They can give you, if you've got a very healthy relationship with a gallery, it can be the most nurturing thing for your practice and get your work into places you could never get your work. Um, sometimes it can be toxic. I had a gallery which didn't end well, mainly because I was too inexperienced and I think the quality, um, I was sending them wet paintings. It was all my fault, basically. I didn't know any better. Um, but this is how you learn. Um, but again, their work, you know, having them as a gallery for me, uh, they took my work to sort of affordable art fairs in Stock Stockholm, um, New York. I was able to um, have my work in countries which I couldn't maybe visit. Um, so there are good things about galleries and gallery connections, but I think that's another episode. I think we should just mainly talk about how patronage through all of this has been such an amazing way of sustaining my life as an artist because I'm not just painting for myself I want to get my work out there in renaissance times the idea of a you know patron think of the Medici family with Michelangelo and Da Vinci and um, all the great artists and masters had patrons you know the Ruskin for the pre-Raphaelites this idea of having a patron just to invest in your work but also support your work and give you confidence maybe when you doubt yourself is is really supportive um I know with YouTube there is Patreon and I was wondering what you guys thought about that if it's something you think I should do to keep making these videos into next year um and should I do it how much do people normally give to videos I mean I'd like some advice actually if anyone's done this before or has any if you know if you'd be willing to sort of patreon uh, be one of my patreons and um, that would be incredible um but yeah i'm opening up that conversation because i've been researching it but i need some advice so any advice you could have on that please leave a comment below um and i can think about maybe if it's something i should do moving forward so i can keep making these videos every week so that's a lot of information you know six seven years of education uh curation, residencies, la la la. It's mainly about painting. I've never stopped loving painting. And I think that's what sustains me. If at any point I wanna put down my paintbrush and try something else, that's okay too. At the moment I've been doing freelance illustration work for leading up to Christmas, um, which is quite nice because it gives me some diversity in, in my mediums that I'm using. So I'm using um, like digital illustration uh, for that. And I love just drawing, um, you know, whether it's on paper or on an iPad with an Apple pencil, you know, it's all, it's all part of being an artist, finding ways to stay creative and stay engaged in what you're doing. Um, but being authentic, I can't say that enough. Whenever I've done a painting, which is forced or I don't really want to do it, or I'm, you know, half engaged, it never turns out well. You know, you want to wait until you're really into something and you're so excited by the research and where it's taking you. And that stuff is electric. So I think that's the best bit of advice I could have if you are a full-time artist or one thinking about being a full-time artist, um, is that the core of it needs to be that you love what you're doing and that you have the energy to sometimes work at all hours of the day. There's no nine to five with being in the studio. Sometimes you get a sudden wave of inspiration at one o'clock in the morning and there has been a moment where I've dragged poor Rafe out into the studio with me in the depths of winter at like midnight because uh, I needed his help stretching and sketching. I think it was like the Corinthian columns of some classical painting and I needed his like eye. Uh, he was very patient with me. So that's the thing about being an artist, there's no there's no time uh, limit to it. It's all, it's all day, every day. I think pricing your work as an artist is a whole other episode in its own right. Um, there is a progression with how you uh, price work. It can be based on the years of education you've had, the time that's gone into refining your skill and that's part of your, um, you know, the value of what you do. You always value yourself. Um, also, the hours you can charge by the hour, how many hours and hours and hours something takes you. You know, if someone's like, well, that's too expensive. You're like, no, it took me like 
three months to, to create. Like you have to value yourself. Um, there is always a kind of feeling of once you've sold a, a work at this level, say it's a drawing of this size in this medium, you can't then sell a very similar piece of work for half the price because someone who paid maybe, you know, a thousand pounds for this, suddenly if they find out you're selling nearly an identical piece of work for 200 pounds, they'll be like, well, why did I pay that much money? And then that will devalue your work. So you, you must always kind of be um, balanced when you're, you're pricing work and consistent. Don't like fluctuate your work and um, make sure you uh, keep it kind of um fair to the people who buy your work you don't you don't want to kind of fluctuate that's where a gallery relationship can be quite helpful because they'll price your work for you and then they'll take care of all of that for you it is a lot of work being your own business manager um and your own agent and your own kind of artist all the hats you wear if we're self-employed obviously um but i think that's an episode we could talk about in the future um next year um if anyone's interested in that um do let me know so I hope you've enjoyed this little insight into my history as a painter and my journey. Um, I feel like there's lots I've missed, but I feel like any more I'd just kind of either bore you to death or, uh, yeah, just go on talking for an hour and nobody wants that. Um, but yeah, please like and subscribe this episode. Um, a comment below would be lovely. I love hearing from you guys, um, particularly if I've touched on any subjects regarding patronage um, or Patreon uh selling work, the logistics of being a full-time artist, how I kind of have to use time management with the kind of admin side of work, how you represent yourself with social media, your brand. These are all subjects we don't really learn as artists. We have to kind of self-learn um, and it's very intimidating. So I'm here to help if anyone is going through something similar and needs someone to chat to, I'm here. Um, but I will think, okay, I think it's about time I did some painting. So I'm gonna get back to the, my work and I will see you next Monday for more Art Life. Um, I think it's Christmas next Monday. I think we'll have to do something Christmassy. Okay, catch you later guys, bye.